Welcome everybody to this session. My name is Lee Brown from Arise and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this session which is titled A Will to Win from Global Crisis to International Justice. Today's event is organised by Arise, the festival of left, Labour's left ideas along with a range of other left organisations, campaigns and publications. This is the final session ahead of our closing rally that will start straight after this panel and that will be there will be joined by John McDonnell, Richard Bergen, Laura Pidcock and many others. We're delighted to have such a great list of speakers and campaigners for this session, which will look at how we advance a progressive internationalist agenda. We have speakers looking at the global climate crisis and the need for climate justice, economic justice and the, anti, the importance of the anti-war movements. Um, and we have a special update on what's going on in India from their Farmers for Justice and again, their movement against the reactionary Modi government there. Unfortunately, our speaker that was going to talk about the global Black Lives Matter movement has just had to pull out, but we send our solidarity to that movement that has done so much to raise the issue across the world of state racism. And we can recommit here today as arrived to fully supporting that movement. Um, as we say, this movement, this session is about making sure our movement isn't just a movement against inequality and austerity at home, but for peace and for justice globally. The COVID crisis has not just shone a spotlight on the huge inequalities within nations, but between them too. Countries in the developing world have been hit hardest. When they should have been supported in investing in their health systems, they've had to keep paying back huge global debts to global creditors. And now we have the appalling situation of global vaccine apartheid. Millions of lives are at threat from a lack of vaccines, which is caused primarily just by patents being inhaled in the hands of a few private pharmaceutical giants. Now there are important global calls to waive the vaccine patents, and yet our government is one of the key governments in the world blocking that from happening. And while our government is cutting back on its aid budget, it is preparing to spend tens of billions more on military spending and on a new generation of nuclear weapons. That's investment that should be going into the real security challenge we, challenges we face, not least the climate crisis, where wealthier nations have a huge responsibility to not only lead the fight on this, but to provide the funds for other countries to make a just transition. So these are some of the issues that we'll be addressing in this session today. As the session is on, you can post questions and comments below the stream on YouTube and in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we'll put some of those to our panel after they've all spoken. And just to remind you, please donate at the link provided so that Arise, we can continue to host these important events and support many other campaigns. Um, and we'll be putting links on the chat and your, uh, throughout this session. So now I'm going to go on to our very first speaker, who is um, an excellent campaigner for peace and for justice, Murad Qureshi from the Stop the War Coalition. Thank you um, for inviting me along, Arise, uh, for this event. Um, it's, uh, it's a very important time, actually, because there are a, a number of things happening uh, globally, which I think we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, the first of those is the, the pivot to Asia, which, um, in effect, is uh, illustrated well by uh, the um, by the British government sending a naval force to uh, very uh, contentious waters uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, Indo-Pacific. Actually, we've sent HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth with a whole artillery of other naval vessels out that way. Now, if you want to take a particular Chinese perspective on that. Uh, it's no doubt a reminder for them of gunboat diplomacy during the Opium Wars. Um, I don't think it takes much reading of, of history to, to see how they may see it uh, that way, uh, certainly. Um, but I think it's also a reflection of increasing anti-Chinese sentiments in the geopolitics, uh, which I think is most health unhealthy. We're seeing it domestically in the UK and uh, the US, the increase in East Asian hate crime. Um, and quite honestly, I'd rather be spending our time and efforts on the war uh, with, uh, with coronavirus, because I do think the Chinese have got a big part to play uh, in it, given that the uh, major production of uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vaccines uh, will uh, undoubtedly come from China. And if you know anything about what's happening from other, in other parts of the world, uh, like the, the part of South Asia my family originates from, uh, they, they're clearly getting uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese vaccines much more quickly than I think is acknowledged here uh, in, in the UK media. So as a result, Stop the War has joined uh, the, the No to Cold War campaign, which will be launched this coming Wednesday. Um, and, um, and, and 
and we certainly need a better appreciation of, of the Chinese perspective on, on these uh, geopolitical matters as, uh, unfortunately, uh, things become increasingly antagonistic, not only in that part of the world, but everywhere, uh, certainly. The, the other thing we shouldn't lose sight of, which, um, uh, which has just been briefly mentioned by our chair, is the, um, the increase in military expenditure by the, uh, the British government, almost by 16 billion pounds which came in the middle of the, um, the pandemic, would you believe it? Um, and it's um, an increase over the next four years, over and above the manifesto commitment, which was already half percent annually on the defence budget for every year of Parliament, which actually makes it about 24.1 billion compared to the previous budget for the parliamentary term. Now, this uh, clearly cements um, the UK's position as the largest uh, defence spender in Europe and also the second largest in NATO. Um, and I think one of the misnomers we've got to realise this isn't actually so much defence, it's more offensive than I think defensive insofar as it's talking about cyber and cyber, uh, space wars um, and these myth, myth, myths of weaknesses in the defence that we've always had. Um, and in some ways, the justification, if you hear the words of the, the Prime Minister at the time when he announced this, was that uh, it's to address uh, the systematic decline that we've had over the last 30 years. The other basis of which it was argued for was it was going to create about 10,000 new jobs in the UK annually. Now, my, my own personal perspective is that you know, you'll get a lot of better bangs for the, your bucks if you had invested that money in the Green New Deal and uh, revamping the infrastructure, uh, the, the, the UK's uh, energy infrastructure. I'm sure it won't be 10,000, it will be hundreds of thousands of jobs. If you just dealt with things like uh, home insulation um, in, 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 uh, in the homes up and down the country, that will certainly create a lot more jobs. And it's not something that's never really taken off at all in this country, although it's been announced by several governments of different persuasions. That's the kind of thing which I think we should see uh, increased investment as we're coming out of uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing us as socialists uh, need to be arguing for uh, within the party and beyond. The, the, the final area, which we, we can't ignore as well, which again came out of the blue, quite honestly, was the increase in our in the UK's nuclear, nuclear capabilities by about 40%, from 180 warheads to about 260 warheads. Now, we've only been given figures of the number of warheads. We really don't know what the, the financial implications are, but I'm sure that, 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 they, that they exist. But it does show clearly that um, we've, we're, we're breaking our commitments to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, um, um, in, in a year when there will be a global non-proliferation treaty conference in August, which was actually meant to have happened last year. So I will be intrigued to hear what the government explanations are for this, um, because I think we should remember politically at the last general election what happened. There was one uh, political leader of a party who uh, declared on, on, on TV that she would press the button if she was asked to. And um, Joe Swinton's political life since then has completely disappeared. Uh, I, I remember actually on the night of the election, uh, her, her loss was the biggest cheer in Kensington Town Hall that we got. And that was from both sides of the political divide. I can tell you this in Kensington. So I think that does t say something about um, how, how, well, uh, how unpopular this, this is potentially, and, but it hasn't been told enough. And I think... Um, it will explain our involvement now increasingly with uh, CND's campaign, certainly around August, and it's something which we shouldn't lose sight of, and we should ask fundamental questions about the um, basis of it, because this is only the first outcomes of the um, integrated review of the UK's foreign defence and development uh, and security policies. There's been a lot of focus on international aid, but we shouldn't lose sight of these two other the, these two other areas: the increase in military expenditure and the increase in nuclear warheads in the UK. It's all about the branding. It's all about global Britain, and it's about us also uh, suggesting that there are different ways of um, going around selling ourselves. Uh, as global Britain, and I think that's got to be made clear in this arena. Um, can I finally also make sure that uh, this is, uh, whilst these are huge issues in themselves, Stop the War isn't going to lose sight of the uh, issues that very often have brought um, members to us. 
I mean, for example, if I wasn't here today, I'd be at uh, outside 10 Downing Street uh, protesting about the situation in Palestine, certainly. And we've kept up our, our campaigning activities uh, earlier in the year in, on the war in Yemen that I think to some extent has been forgotten since uh, January, February and, and, the, and, and how critically the British government were involved in supplying arms to it. And finally, um, in some ways, um, coming up to our 20th, um, um, 20th birthday later on in the year, uh, we'll be looking back again at Afghanistan. Um, so th there is a, a, a much more complicated global context, but I think there are ways of dealing with it and we've got to deal with it domestically by being uh, certainly a lot less anti-Chinese, um, dealing with um, alternative proposals for the increased military expenditure, um, and finally um, challenging the increase in warheads. It really is out of kilter with where global policy has been going on this front for many, many years. I mean, even the Ukrainians got rid of their nuclear warheads, for God's sake, and we see the increase in it, um, and it's, it's a similar story in other parts of the world. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much there, Morad. Um, I'll just introduce our next three speakers that we have in this session. We're going to hear next from Mark Weisbrox, who's the co-director of the Centre for Economic and Policy Research in the United States, a very excellent organisation that everybody should follow on Twitter. They do fantastic reports on the economy in the US, the global economy, but also on the politics of Latin America. Then we have Mark Watts from the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. He'll be speaking in a personal capacity about the centrality of climate justice to building a world of peace and justice. And then finally, a very important speaker we hear from Namala Rajasingam, who's going to be speaking about the situation in India, and she's from the South Asia Solidarity. Um, so thank you for that, Murad. I think it's very important we address this issue of a Cold War, um, not merely because these Cold Wars can become hot wars, but because it puts a real barrier um, in front of all the global cooperation that we need um, on health, on climate, on tackling poverty. And this is really a US-led war on China, Cold War on China. We should be playing no part in it. Um, our next speaker then, as I said, is from the US. It's Mark Weisbrot, the co-director of the Centre for Economic and Policy Research. Over to you, Mark. Uh, thanks, Lee, and, and thanks, Murad, for that uh, summary of what the UK is doing. And I think uh, I'm going to start out with just um, uh, what I see as one of the biggest problems that doesn't get enough attention. And that's just you know how the high-income countries, uh, the led by the United States, uh, are able to maintain control over most of the of the world, and a lot of that takes place through these uh, so-called multilateral institutions: the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization. And you can see the world trade, the impact of the World Trade Organization in this uh, struggle against vaccine apartheid, of course, which I think other people are going to talk about. And, uh, but you have this terrible distribution of vaccines and you have, you know, 62 countries now in the WTO uh, trying to, uh, fighting to uh, waive the intellectual property, so-called intellectual property restrictions on production of vaccines just so the rest of the world can produce more. And this is an example of uh, how the US and uh, Europe and they, they really do act together in, 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 in these organizations. Or in the case of the IMF, you know, the US just has control. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute uh, because you know, this was established back in 1946 and there's no reason that this late in the 21st century, the United States can just veto uh, whatever the IMF wants to do. And then there's also direct intervention and here, you know, we work a lot on, on Latin America, and here you can see the direct intervention uh, in in terms of actual coups, the Bolivia, the coup in Bolivia in 2019, which was uh, finally uh, partially reversed. Uh, and then you have uh, sanctions, and I won't talk about that because it's it takes too long to exp you know to just describe the damage, but these these huge sanctions, you know. Given, for example, against Venezuela, they destroyed uh, three quarters of the Venezuelan economy, something you've not even seen in wartime uh, in, in, in the world, uh, pretty much. And uh, this is a really powerful, this has become more powerful than military intervention. And, and of course, it's completely illegal and, and uh, violates international law and the OAS charter, the UN charter, and so on. But uh, 
this is uh, something. So this is these are the things that I think uh, will have to uh, change. Uh, they're being used all the time. You know, in the 21st century, as you all know, you had a you reached a point where uh, progressive governments, left of center governments, were in power in uh, were elected in in uh, the for the majority of of, of Latin America. And the U.S. intervened in Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela and Bolivia and Honduras and Paraguay. Some of these countries were coups in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, and they they changed it. But now it's uh, it is coming back, and I'll, I'll get to the positive side in just a little bit. Well, here's one: Peru just had an election, and a leftist who had never run for office before uh, defeated the right wing candidate. She's still fighting; she's claiming uh, fraud, but she's not getting uh, much support. And uh, this is a big change. I mean, this is a country with a very rich and powerful elite that has been allied with the United States uh, very strongly. And uh, that's uh, going to change. He's gonna have trouble, of course, uh, because he doesn't have the parliament and they can you know, use that to try and impeach him and so on. But uh, it's, it's still a big, a big change. And it shows that there is, uh, it's one of the places where there is resistance. And that's why the Bolivian, uh, the MAS, the movement toward, was able to come back, um, you know, uh, after the coup. Uh, one second. I have to uh, plug in my computer because it's about to die. I didn't have this in. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, um, and, you know, on the positive side, that's one example. I mean, the positive side. And I think a lot, some of that is a result of the left. You know, here's another multilateral institution. The Organization of American States is controlled by the United States. And it has a, a secretary general who's, uh, you know, who does whatever they want, uh, Luis Almagro. And he was the one who was responsible more than anyone for the coup in Bolivia. And I want to say just one thing if I have uh, a minute on this, because I think a, a good part of the left uh, got uh, that wrong. They didn't, you know, that was a coup that was more of a US coup than anything since 1973 in Chile. And there was a part of the left that didn't uh, see that either, didn't do anything or even some su supported it. And uh, you have this problem uh, where some of the left no longer uh, sees that it's, it's really wrong for the United States to choose the leaders of, uh, of Latin American uh, countries. So, uh, which is of course the default view in the foreign policy establishment here. Um, so in terms of uh, progress on the positive side, you did have, and this is something that we fought for with uh, you know, over 200 organizations in the US, uh, the IMF did something positive for once. You know, we've been fighting against them for over 20 years. And they uh, agreed to create uh, $650 billion worth of special drawing rights, which is a reserve asset at the IMF and distributed to all countries, about 40% going to the low and middle income countries, but still it's a lot. And, uh, you know, and this was after the US House passed uh, legislation that we fought for, which called for 2 trillion, but there's still, and that's still going on, that fight is still going on. This is a fight that's been going on at the, at the IMF uh, you know, since it was created, can it play a positive role at all as a, you know, like a central bank would pay? There's no conditions on this money. There is no, they're not loans. They don't have to be paid back. And this is, uh, you know, this is a first. Uh, well, it's not that they did, they did something like it smaller in, in 2009. But the point is uh, that that is uh, an example. And, you know, at the WTO, there's been enormous fights now for 20 years that have made a big difference. They've stopped uh, most of what they, the entire agenda of the, of the World Trade Organization. And, and now they're fighting you know, for the vaccines. This is organizations from all over the world and some governments too. And that could happen at the IMF too. I mean, the problem is that the IMF, the people representing countries at the IMF are quite uh, different and the rules are different, of course, as well. But there's nothing, you know, that, that, that says that the United States has to control uh, the IMF. So we need much more, and that's another place where there could be a big fight. And finally, uh, I will say something about the, the high income countries. Do I have time or no? Yep. Okay, so the rich countries are a different story. And, I'm, and by the way, for the developing world, 
you do have some uh, one positive thing going forward, and that's uh, China's uh, growth. China is already bigger than the United States as an economy by the measure that economists use for international comparison, which is purchasing uh, power parity. And within nine years, they're going to be twice the size of the United States. And so sometime in that period, we're going to have a different financial system and one which the United States won't be able to use to destroy entire economies and force countries, governments to bend to their will. And so that's going to happen. I can't tell you exactly when, but it will happen. Now, uh, the um, uh, for the rich countries, I think the main thing is macroeconomic policy. And you can see that here in the United States. You have fiscal policy like we've never had before. I mean, deficits of 14.9% of GDP uh, last year, 10.3% uh, of GDP this year. And you have monetary policy, which you've also never had, had before. Uh, and if we can keep this, uh, I think, so, so there's a crucial fight going on in the US because th there's, there's going to be more resistance to those policies. And we have a special thing. Uh, this is a really historic moment in the United States. And I say this not because just the United States, but it will make a difference in the world because uh, we have what you know, is really minority rule in the United States. We have the system uh, where you know you you have voter suppression and gerrymandering and the electoral college and uh, the Supreme Court and uh, and more that's really prevents us from having a democratic country and all this is up for grabs uh, in the next few years and it, so I would say it's really crucial here that it, if if the uh, the majority party here gets its macro policy uh, and is able to maintain these, uh, gains that we've made in macroeconomic policy, this country will change. And as a result, the world will change uh, as well because this is the center of the empire. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there is a relationship. It's not like the 1960s where you could have, you know, LBJ was a, a great president here in terms of civil rights and Medicare, Medicaid, and then uh, wage a genocidal war in Vietnam. There's more of a connection now between foreign policy and domestic policy than we've had uh, for a long time. It's still not, I mean, it's not that great. I mean, you know, Biden hasn't changed Latin American policy one bit, uh, but you will see uh, changes and, or, or maybe I should say it in the negative, you can't really have change here without changing the structure of this country. And just, I'll give one example of a, one more positive one where we did win, uh, not completely yet, but we got both houses of Congress for the first time ever to vote to order the president uh, to get out of Yemen, uh, the war, the genocidal war in Yemen in, in terms of the, you know, the uh, aerial uh, refueling, the logistical support, and the other uh, help that the U.S. Uh, intervent, I mean, it's more than help, you know, the participation in that war. And it hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. I think the first thing that's going to happen is the, uh, is the U.S. is going to stop participating in the Saudi blockade. So these things are happening here. I just want to say that because there is change and you, we're going to see more of it. That's about the best I can do for right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. There, Mark. Uh, I think the points you raise on vaccine uh, inequality are absolutely central and have to be a priority for all progressives. I mean, the G7 is taking place in Britain at the moment. The area that it's taking place in, in Cornwall, in Britain, has had more vaccines than 22 African nations combined. And this is a very, very sparsely populated area of Britain. Um, there's absolutely no need for this. As we know, this is people being put second to profit. We could easily end the vaccine patents overnight, there's enough support in the WTO. And I don't think people in Britain are clear enough that one of the key nations preventing this is Britain. Even Biden now supported the patent waiver. Um, but Boris Johnson, along with Angela Merkel in Germany, because of their close links to their pharmaceutical industries, are just not prepared as it stands to allow the waiver of their patents, despite the pressure from over hundred countries. So I think we in Arise need to keep supporting the People's Vaccine Alliance in their campaign for our own government to support this international call for a waiver. Um, going on now to our next speaker is Mark Watts, who's going to be looking at the ongoing need. While obviously much of the world has been focused on the uh, health crisis, we need to continue to take the climate crisis as an absolute priority in the international struggle. So we'll move on now to Mark Watts. Thanks, Lee, and, and thanks to Matt and all the uh, organisers arrived for 
chance to participate today. Um, I am indeed going to focus on, on climate breakdown, but I think as, as we've heard, the, we've currently got to deal with multiple global crises from certainly from a pandemic, which remains an existential risk for hundreds of millions of, of people, and the climate emergency, which is an existential risk for everybody alive today and born tomorrow. And I, you know, I think we shouldn't, we should always go back to the fact that both of these crises share root causes. First in humanity's thoughtless destruction of our natural environment, which is tipping our climate into a state where human civilization can't be sustained and which has made it far easier for diseases of wild animals to transfer to humans, as we've seen with COVID. But secondly, in the rampant inequality that we all now, all countries suffer as a result of decades of a global economy dominated by neoliberal capitalism, which makes hundreds of millions more vulnerable to the consequences of both COVID and climate breakdown. So, you know, I very much think that the focus on international justice in the context of global crisis in the title of this session is a very helpful way to frame uh, the discussion. First, because so solving an existential crisis like climate breakdown or the COVID pandemic requires a degree of global collaboration that has never been achieved before by humanity. Obviously, the last thing we need is a new Cold War, as, as Murad uh, and Lee have referred to, and in fact, collaboration between the US and China in particular, particular is absolutely critical uh, on climate breakdown. But moreover, it, it means this need for global collaboration means that everyone has to see that they've got a stake in their society because the scale, the speed of change that's required, particularly to decarbonize our economy is gonna be absolutely tumultuous. But secondly, stopping both COVID and climate breakdown requires paying serious attention to science and data. And if we do that, we get a pretty clear idea of the balance of responsibility for change. But as we've seen really clearly in the last year in particular, neither a collaborative approach to crisis solving at a global level or science-based government can be achieved within a neoliberal capitalist framework because the greed of the 1% so frequently triumphs over what should be rational decision-making that would benefit everybody. So there needs to be major political change for a science-based approach to these crises to be um, achieved. That said, though, I mean, looking, looking at from the climate crisis at the moment, there's been more progress in the last few months than in the previous five years since the Paris Agreement and for much of the 20 years that I've been involved in the struggle around to prevent climate breakdown. We're not winning, we're not on track, but we're much less off track than we were most importantly, China now we see is transitioning from having domestic policies that have dramatically shifted global markets, particularly for renewable energy and electric vehicles, to now showing the first signs of some genuine international leadership. And then I think secondly, a, a really noticeable shift now in the balance of forces within the global capitalist class. For the first time, those who see climate breakdown amongst the, the, the global capitalist leadership see that climate breakdown is ultimately bad for everybody and now in the ascendancy, only just, but in the ascendancy over those who think that their wealth and privilege can protect them from climate breakdown. And so have resisted a shift from the fossil fuel economy from which they profited so greatly. And the signs of that are everywhere from the successful shareholder revolts against Chevron and Exxon in the last few weeks to the Dutch courts requiring Shell to halve its emissions by 2030. But of course, most importantly, in some major, if incremental, policy shifts from capitalist governments. So I want to spend a, just a, a minute or so on, on numbers, because numbers are essential in, in thinking about the climate challenge, um, both to understand the scale and the immediacy, and because the numbers that are used, particularly the percentage reductions that countries bend, bend around, can be very confusing. The first and most important number for me is that we've got six years left of budget. It's 230 to 40, 440 billion tonnes of carbon. Um, that's to keep our global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, but it's really the time that's important here. If we carried on burning carbon at the rate of the last few years, that budget would be gone in six years. So it's an emergency because we've got almost no time left. And the General Secretary of the United Nations puts this very, very well. He says repeatedly, we're on the verge of an abyss. 
And so we better make sure our next step is in the right direction. The big progress here, though, in the, in the last few months is that the major polluting governments have now accepted that basic premise of the size of that carbon budget, uh, and most importantly, the, the really dramatic shift in policy in the US since Biden became president. Second number um, is halving within a decade, which the generally agreed short term for staying within that carbon budget is that global emissions have to halve every decade from now on. But the most crucial halving is the first one between now and 2030. And again, there's been some real progress here, not in the reality of that, of reducing that budget, but in the commitment to do so. A year ago, halving by 2030 wasn't on the agenda for the forthcoming climate talks in Glasgow. The best that most people thought would be possible was agreement on reaching zero carbon by mid-century. So agreeing there's an emergency, but only committing to action uh, 30 years in the future. And that changed dramatically last September when China committed to a peak emissions date of 2030 alongside carbon neutrality by 2060. And that commitment alone shaved half a degree of global overheating off the trajectories uh, for where we were going. And then that's followed a slew of, of, of targets from major polluting countries, Japan, EU, South Korea, the UK, all pushing upwards and then topped off uh, in March by the US through Biden committing to halve its emission by 2030. So that is real and genuine progress of the like we haven't seen for many years. To put it in context, however, Climate Action Tracker assesses that that's reduced the gap between where we are and where we need to be by 2030 by about 10 to 14 percent. So there's a long, long way to go. And if you look at where the money's flowing, uh, an analysis last week showing that in the G7 governments alone invested $189 billion in the fossil fuel sector just during the pandemic, just government funding, more than they put into clean energy. So the money is still flowing in the wrong direction. And in fact, the single biggest test, if you want to apply one of any government's commitment to climate action at the moment, is where they're putting their, their stimulus because it's so big, it has such an extraordinary opportunity to shift the global economy. And we need to have a really significant green and a just uh, recovery. Final number. Uh, that I want to come to is is 100 billion or maybe it needs to be a trillion, which is the, the money that needs to transfer from the West to the global South on an annual basis to tackle the climate crisis. Because going back to my first point here, the, the, this challenge is global crisis around climate as with COVID requires global collaboration. That means every country has got to act, every country has got to be bought in. And yet there are vast differences in responsibility and immediate impacts. Of, of climate uh, conditions. And whilst the focus absolutely needs to be on the richest nations who've done the most to cause the climate crisis, we've left it so late now, only six years with it of that climate carbon budget left, that the big countries in the global south, what they do now does really matter. What Brazil, Indonesia, India, and of course China, which is still a global south country. And whilst cutting pollution is good for everybody in the long term, so it's in those countries' interest to rapidly decarbonise, the cost of transitioning really, really quickly from fossil fuel economy to a green one is very high. And so we need to see now the promised $100 billion a year that the rich countries committed to as part of that Paris Agreement, which has never materialised, about $20 billion, uh, the best that's been put in any one year so far. Uh, and that number needs to rise because the real cost for the global south, not only to decarbonise, but also to adapt is probably more like a trillion dollars a year. So just to close, um, I think, you know, what, what needs to happen to go from a global crisis to international justice in the case of the climate emergency is first a big test in the capitalist countries is a, is a fast green recovery, stop investing in the bad stuff, all stimulus needs to be green. And then secondly, we need, we need global justice. Vaccine equity, so my organization, C40, calls for both uh, the uh, patent waiver alongside an end for public subsidy for fossil fuels uh, and all stimulus to be green. And we need climate finance justice. And of course, the last thing we need is a new Cold War. Thanks for listening. Uh, back to you, Lee. Thank you very much there, Mark, for showing why this needs to be a central part of our campaigning for international justice. Um, I'm going to move on to our final speaker. We will have all have seen some of the terrifying and distressing scenes coming from India in recent months around um, 
the public health crisis, and that's continuing to, to spiral out of control. But also we will have seen those hugely inspiring scenes of the farmers' protest and the farmers' struggle, one of the biggest mass movements in all of human history. So we're delighted now to move on to our final speaker in this session, and then we'll take questions that people have been putting on the chat, so you should continue to put on the chat. Our final speaker in this session is Namala Rajasingham from South Asia Solidarity. Thank you very much for inviting me. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the whole world was subjected to the harrowing scenes of a pandemic gone out of control in India and a government that had completely abandoned its people as it was more interested in building its popularity through mass religious festivals and election rallies and ensuring profits for the big Indian farmer like Serum Institute, the largest vaccine producer in the world by not carrying out a timely and free vaccine rollout in India itself. But this disregard for the welfare of its people by the Hindu supremacist BJP is built into the very fabric of its thinking, its vision for India as a shining new corporate India, not a people's democracy, and also pandering to the idea of India becoming a global economic power. And this is to be achieved by a Hindu supremacist political strongman at the helm driving this change. This means minorities, especially Muslims, sorry, minorities, especially Muslims, Christians, and Dalits are systematically marginalized. And those women activists, farmers, students, human rights defenders, journalists who dare to dissent are hounded, intimidated, and locked up in prison. Since 2014, when Modi came to power, we have seen state-sponsored mob violence against minorities on an unprecedented scale. Public and governance institutions, especially the judiciary, have been radically politicized to both embrace Hindutva and act with a bias in favor of the ruling party. The Modi regime has enacted a series of laws aimed at consolidating Hindutva rule. The citizenship laws that exclude Muslims and pro-corporate farm laws that will completely trash the rural agricultural economy of millions of farmers, and the abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution, reneging on India's obligation of recognizing Kashmiri autonomy. The Hindu fascist regime wedded to the Indian corporate, corporates has championed the rise of corporate figures like Ambani of Reliance and Adani, who have not only bought up India wholesale, but under Modi, but also are in search of opportunities abroad. The international dimension of this can be clearly illustrated by one specific example. The Modi regime is a staunch ally of Netanyahu and now of Israel today, completely reversing India's proud record of decades long solidarity with the Palestinian people, both successive governments and the Indian people. Today, India is the largest procurer of Israeli arms. India is also in receipt of Israel's important export, counterinsurgency methods of training. And of course, this will be deployed in places like uh, Kashmir. This is a bleak picture of Indian democracy, but there are many reasons for us to be optimistic that despite the scale of the repression and the terrifying rise of Hindu fascist forces, there is much resistance on all sides. When the citizenship laws were passed, Thousands of Indian citizens marched right across the country, prominent amongst them Muslims, supported by large swathes of people from all ethnic groups and Hindu, Hindus as well, and obviously backed by the broad left movement in India. The Muslim community is said to be a frontline force today for Indian democracy to protect the secular constitution of India, which Modi wants to tear up and make a new Hindutva constitution to build an exclusivist Hindu state. The women of Shahin Bagh of Delhi carried out a sit-in lasting several months and only the pandemic ended it. As, dissenters, as dissenting activists from Hindutva ideology are being picked up daily and thrown in prison as anti-nationals under colonial laws of sedition, more are joining the ranks of resistance every day. The historic farm and farmers movement is the greatest inspiration, is in its seventh historic month and has stopped the Modi government's plans to implement the farm laws 
on its tracks for the moment. And it has inspired many globally. The farmers are still camped out there, living their lives of protest despite the pandemic. In May, they declared a black day of protest to mark the sixth month into the protest. On June 26th this month, a big move to protest in front of governor's houses is being planned under the slogan, save farming, save democracy. Uh, they see all of this as part of India's, uh, you know, democratic campaign for democracy. Separate women's committees are being formed on the campsites of protest. The newsletter Trolley Times is continuing to be published. While the farmers are camped in Singhu, Tikri and Ghazibad, parallel actions are taking place in the farmers' villages. What does this all mean to us on the left in Britain and especially the South Asian left? How do we organize our solidarity in support of struggles in India? A section of the Indian diaspora community in the UK and in the US and elsewhere are ardent supporters of the BJP government and Hindutva ideology. They are politically active through organizations like the HSS, the Hindu Swayam Servat Sangh, the British branch of the fascist RSS, which is also the parent organization of the BJP and was set up inspired by European fascism, uh, fascist movements in the 1920s, but in fact has outlived these European fascist movements. The RSS has several admirers amongst British politicians. The HSS, Hindu, the Swayam Servat Sang in Britain, and the Hindu Society have successfully lobbied the Tories to muzzle the implementation of caste discrimination legislation in Britain. Now they see themselves as targets and victims of what they call Hindu phobia. They have close political affinity to pro-Israel lobbies in the UK and are fashioning a campaign against what they call Hindu phobia. If we criticize the Modi regime or Hindu fascism or call out casteism, we will be called a Hindu foe, similar to how anti-Semitism is invoked against critics of Israel. But unlike anti-Semitism in Europe, which evolved over a millennia ago historically, there is no materiality to this notion of Hindu phobia in Europe. Now, if you call out caste discrimination, you could be accused of racism against, within inverted commas, Hindus now. The last point I just want to make is that Modi and Johnson have become, begun trade talks virtually, as both of them are keen to secure a deal to boost their respective political careers. Uh, Boris Johnson needs a, a trade deal very quickly uh, post-Brexit, and uh, Modi does as well. Along with the trade deal, Modi is keen to secure opportunities for Indian multinationals in the UK. What is also really concerning is that he has also agreed to take back Indians who are here illegally, which will trigger mass deportations and removals. And this, I believe, is already underway uh, ever since the new immigration rules and guidance that was introduced in January 21, soon post Brexit. Um, and it is already, it's already underway. And I feel that maybe the Glasgow incident was, was one of those uh, um, because there were two Indian nationals who they were trying to deport at the time. So these are some of the issues that the British left and, 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 and of course, solidarity with the farmers protest and, and the South Asian left in this country have to take into account when organizing solidarity with struggles for social justice, equality, and democracy in India. And I, I also will put on the chat one little thing is that South Asia Solidarity Group has uh, recently done a very um, uh, short spoofy video uh, satirizing this relationship. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I think I sent it to the organizers and I don't know whether one of you can put it on the chat so people can view it afterwards. I will try to do it if I can. Thank you. I'm really sorry I was juggling around my iPad. Sorry about that. Well, that was a brilliant presentation. So thank you for that, despite whatever technical difficulties you have. And we have just put your video in the chat so everybody can watch that. It's on YouTube. Um, so now we've got a little bit of time to go to questions. We've had a number in. Just keep on dropping them in the chat. And we'll, if we've got time, we can put them to the speakers. I'll try to tailor them. I'll merge some of them because we've had quite a few and um, direct them at the most relevant person to respond. So the first one is for you, uh, Mark Weisbrook, and it's on Joe Biden, really. We've heard a lot of positive things here um, about his domestic agenda in terms of his big 
um, boost to social security and health care and social care, um, the big stimulus package. I think we haven't really heard so much about these foreign policies. Could you just give us a little bit of a backdrop to what you think um, around Biden's foreign policies and the changes that are being made and the continuation that there is with um, what went before it? Well, there hasn't been a lot of change. I mean, Latin America is a special case in US foreign policy. I mean, that is the hardest to change because, you know, you have a big complex uh, so-called national security state here. You got the Pentagon, the State Department, the National Security Council, the foreign policy committees of Congress. And, uh, you know, they don't always agree. And so they'll have differences. They have differences on, you know, uh, on, on the Middle East, on uh, Iran, uh, on a good part of the world. And, and, but in Latin America, they just have this agree, you know, idea that this is ours and we want it back. You know, that's been the last 20 years. And, uh, and there's no real dissent. And as a result, the media doesn't have much, uh, uh, you know, objectivity. Uh, I mean, even less than they have in the rest of foreign policy. I think, well, you know, on Afghanistan, he's been, you know, he has been different in the Senate. Well, I mean, Trump actually wanted to get out <laughs> as well. But I mean, for, you know, as compared to the usual uh, kind of uh, liberal interventionist foreign policy, he is getting out and he's um, mostly, uh, I think he was more determined that than you would have a typical uh, democratic president maybe. And that was partly because of his experience uh, in the Obama administration where he did fight uh, to get out uh, in there and uh, they got rolled by the generals and, and so on. Uh, but I think uh, mostly uh, he hasn't really, he hasn't changed. He's changed the things that, you know, the uh, interventionists want. I mean, in terms of relations with Europe, the China stuff, as you can see, is is, is pretty bad uh, in terms of a new Cold War. Uh, so um, I think in Israel, Palestine, he did give in to some uh, pressure, but not very much. Uh, I, I think he will see some change. You know, Israel, Palestine was a good example of you. Again, you want to look on the positive side. You you had. The movement for Black Lives had 15 million people in the streets, and it was the largest demonstrations in U.S. history. And that, uh, you know, changed a lot of consciousness here. The, you know, around racism, racism, and uh, and that extent, and you could see that in the Israel-Palestine, the latest uh, conflict, and the U.S. Uh, having, you know, uh, I mean the discussion here in the US, I should say, was different than previously. I mean, you have public opinion changing, and I think you will see more uh, recognition of the violent racism of US foreign policy and more connection uh, between that and the racist violence here in within the US. And so that is, that is one place where I think he felt pressure from the US Congress which was feeling uh, the pressure from the base of the Democratic Party because of this, uh, this really significant uh, change in, in consciousness recently. I think that will extend uh, to other countries as well, but it's a very hard struggle. Uh, you know, the only positive side you can say is that in the US Congress, there is pushback, uh, even in Latin America, you have the chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee, for example, uh, said that the U.S. is missing an opportunity to negotiate uh, with Venezuela. They actually opposed what Biden is doing there. And uh, and there, the Europeans can play a role too. You know, the Europeans did move. Uh, they, they did uh, re stop recognizing uh, Guaido as the interim, so-called interim president, which is a sanction itself because it cuts off all these assets all over the world to Venezuela and uh, causes a lot of suffering there. And, but Europe is still much too aligned with the US on Latin America. And so Biden, uh, you know, doesn't feel that much pressure from there. Thank you for that, Mark. Morad, the next question is really aimed, well, it's aimed at Britain's foreign policy. So I think you're the best person to respond on that. 
quite a general question, really. So uh, you've got just a few minutes to answer this sweeping question. But what would you, how would you describe a progressive British foreign policy? Um, what are the key demands that we should have on the Labour Party and on the government um, if we were if we're to fight for progressive foreign policy? So that's quite broad. Yeah, you need to unmute. Uh, you're, you're quite right, Lee. That is quite broad. So I'll reiterate the points I've been making. I think it's very important that we don't take this uh, anti-Chinese bias in geopolitics at face value. I think it's it's got to be looked at fundamentally. Um, I think Mark from America mentioned that they are the biggest economy now in the world. It's, it's very rarely acknowledged. Uh, I think they are a power of influence and good in, 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 in climate uh, agenda. I think if you're going to get through to the Asian middle classes, which I do think you've got to sell uh, climate change to, uh, the Chinese uh, authorities are your best way uh, through. Um, the second thing is don't lose sight of, um, of, of what the uh, the British government's doing uh, in the middle of a, um, a, a response to the pan pandemic. Increase military spending. Um, uh, levels of which we've never heard of before. Um, and this is all part of the, the first uh, part of the, uh, the, the review of the UK's foreign defence and development security policy. Now, the focus so far, uh, for, for very understandable reason, has been on foreign aid and, and, and it going from 0.7 to 0.5. But I think we're losing sight in terms of amounts, certainly, what's happening on increased military expenditure, the 16 billion I mentioned, and what, uh, what, what better you could do with that money. Certainly, if you want to try to get an economy out of uh, uh, pandemic uh, and into uh, um, a, a, a green environmentally based ones, I think those kind of money sh should seriously be going into a Green New Deal in the UK economy, which will create more jobs than I think the defence industries annually. I'm pretty certain about that. The experts can confirm that. And the final thing, we don't lose sight. We have increased our warheads. No one else in the world has done that. Um, and that's out of keeping with our, uh, not only our international obligations, but the general tone of where we were going. The Non-Proliferation Treaty has you know, been around for 50 years and it's got, had consensus in continents like Latin America, as well as uh, in, in Europe. And suddenly out of the blue, we have um, the British Prime Minister declaring we'll increase the warheads. I do think we've got to not lose sight of uh, these issues in the, the geopolitics and Britain's future role uh, as global Britain, because I think that's what we're seeing and that's what we've got to have to respond to. Um, uh, for example, uh, as I said right at the outset, we, we, we've already sent an armada to, to, uh, to, to, to the Indo-Pacific, um, um, te te tense waters in the Indo-Pacific. Now, I'm not sure that's been given, the, 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 it's, it's, it's been done in our, sh should be done in our name, given how it can create huge amounts of tensions and turn a cold war into a hot war very, very quickly from just a few incidences out in sea. Thank you, Marad. Um, I'll, well, I've got two more questions, which I'll do direct one at each uh, of the two speakers, and then we'll come back for final remarks. Um, Mark, again, it's quite a broad question, but I think it's a very interesting one, that Boris Johnson's made a lot about the green rhetoric, um, but the question was that so sure what it will actually uh, look like in reality. Um, what for you should a real green transition look like in the UK? Well, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a slightly contradictory position on the UK's climate policy because certainly the, the targets are genuinely world leading and are you know, more or less in line with what the science says they, they should be, particularly the nearer term uh, targets where, where Britain has, has gone a bit ahead of, of others, you know, 65, 70% reductions within the next 10, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, there's a, Britain also stands on a, on a record, if you just look at the conventional analysis of uh, a country's emissions, Britain's emissions have been going down relatively uh, steadily for the, la for the last few years. I think the, the problem arises in, is when you really dig into it, Partly Britain's apparent success is based on the fact that so much of our pollution causing industry uh, has, has been offshored and we rely on the manufacturing of our products in, in China and Asia in, in particular. And the emissions then count on their balance, not ours, although we consume them. And that's true for, for many of the, the big Western capitalist economies. 
uh, and indeed the you know the international to go back to some of the uh, Mark's points uh, earlier the the international methodology for account carbon accounting was designed so that it favors the Western capitalist economies and focuses on what's produced within your geographical boundary rather than that which you consume, uh, which would show a very different picture. But the, you know, I think the, the big well, the big thing that you really need to see is, it, is, in, is in the policies that have been put in place absolutely right now in response to the COVID pandemic, because there will never be such a large injection of public in, investment in a short space of time, as is now happening to try and restart the economy in Britain uh, and elsewhere. And it will have a decisive influence on whether or not we genuinely are gonna halve global emissions in the next decade or carry on on the previous trajectory. And at the moment, the balance sheet isn't good. Uh, generally, still far too much money is flowing into, into sectors of the economy, which are either are directly fossil fuel producing or which uh, need to, to change dramatically and conditions are not being applied to the money that supports those industries. Obviously, we should be supporting workers, we should be uh, protecting people's income, but we need to be asking industries to change very dramatically with that, with that public funding. Lee, if I could, I'd, I'd, I would, I'd like to come back on that, that first question as well, because just to add to, to Mark's answer on, on Biden's foreign policy, I do think you know, there's one very significant seismic change between Trump and Biden, which is on climate policy. Trump, Trump's policy was to actively try and destroy the international agreement, the Paris Agreement, uh, which at least was, was making some dent in what's needed to tackle climate breakdown. And he did a pretty good job of it, effectively stalling international collaboration for four years. Biden has very quickly and very decisively uh, re-entered the US into the Paris Agreement, set a much, much, much better target for US emissions and, and put significant uh, federal dollars in trying to achieve that target. None of it big enough, but it's a really big and significant change in the and US leadership on climate internationally is something you can talk about with loads of conditions around it, but it's a, a seismic change from where Trump was at. Yeah, sorry, I didn't think of that when uh, said uh, when Lee said foreign policy, I wasn't thinking of that as the traditional foreign policy, but that's absolutely right. Well, thank you both. Um, Namala, this question is really specifically aimed at you. Um, so yeah. Really, what the questioner was basically saying, could you say a little bit more about the um, the climate justice movements in India and the strength of them and what their main demands are? I think, you know, with India being such a huge country, uh, we can have a real bearing on the future of the global climate justice movement. So people would like to just know a little bit more about that. The climate justice movement in India, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not well versed on the overall total climate justice movement, but climate justice issues are issues for the poor there, land dispossession. For instance, these corporates that Modi has supported, Ambani and Adani are, and, and Vedanta, they are waiting, they are poised, waiting to, dis, uh, to, to throw out millions, over a million uh, Adivasis living on the Indian hinterlands, the, you know, territory that, has, that is totally unspoiled. They have lived there for millennia, you know, even before the settled civilizations began. Uh, Adivasis, I suppose you would say, the aboriginals of India. And they're all in these crucial mine-rich uh, mountains. And, 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 and the big plan is to dispossess them and, you know, throw them off the land. Because, because this is getting ready for mining. And of course, Adivasi activists and Dalit, Dalits and the Adivasis are the bottom of, of Indian society. So it's, it's a very serious issue that is coming to the fore now. And there's a lot of activism. And of course, uh, the broad Indian left movement is, is linked with them. That is what I can say. But I also saw a comment about Tulsi Gabbard. And I would say, anybody who uses this Hindu four uh, notion is an absolute no-no. And I just want to, in, in, in relation to that, I want to share something very relevant to Britain because Keir Starmer, when he became leader of the Labour Party, within a few days, he met with the BOD. They were, they were one of the first organizations he met. And then we saw a letter that the Hindu society had written where the BOD had recommended to them, to Keir Starmer, to meet the Hindu society. Within a few days later, he had met with them. And South Asia Solidarity Group, we wrote a public letter and a letter to Keir Starmer, which became an open letter, raising a lot of the issues that I raised today. 
And, and, and I mean, we have of course had no response. The fundamental problem in here is on, on one level, we want to be friendly with corporate India, India because we want to be, we want to be um, um, for one reason is to, we are worried about the emergence of China. And so we want to juxtapose India against it. So we want to privilege India's positioning and, and, and we are willing to overlook. And both, both parties are guilty of this, I, I would say. And the other thing is that we have fundamentally our race policy. We have got it, the Labour Party, got it wrong. We have no understanding of how to look at race. So race, with, as far as the South Asians are concerned, it's all about this culture and faith communities and all of that. And so these issues can be very skillfully wrapped up uh, into culture issues that you, if you are against our cultural practice of caste, then you are a racist. Uh, so it's it's because we have to do a lot of groundwork to understand theoretical, theoretical, political theoretical understanding of how race uh, cuts across these various communities. And I'm sorry, in the Labour Party, I do not find that it has been done. Even the left has, has a long way to go, in my opinion. And that is one reason that we are supporting. These kind of uh, these kind of you know or supporting or keeping silent when these kinds of grossly unjust and ra radically reactionary um, ideas creeping into into our and and that they can call us South Asians are, people like me are going to be racist or exactly like how people in the Jewish Voice for Labour are being called anti-Semitic we are going we are being called Hindu folks. And, and so are our white comrades. So this is something that has to be tackled. Otherwise, we have a serious problem uh, with the South Asian, um, um, you know, having South Asians on side, the left has to think about how to deal with this problem. Because ordinary South Asians, uh, ordinary, I mean, of course, there are the corporate South Indians um, who are very financially well endowed, powerful, etc. But, and the ordinary, ordinary South Asians have always, been broadly on the left, voted labor, etc. But this is a new idea that we have to deal with. And, and, and that is to understand the, the race question properly, question of race, is race and nationalism properly, theoretically. And of course, I know I, I'm not expecting much from the Labour Party, the mainstream Labour Party at the moment. So, but we, we have to continue to do the homework there. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that, Namala. I mean, it's just an area of the world that I think most of the British left has just not really focused on before. And it's clear that we're going to have to spend more attention, pay more attention to uh, the political developments inside India and India's relationship with China. So thank you for that. Um, would all, I'll just come back to all the speakers now, just for one minute closing remarks, and then we'll move on to the final rally. So I'll keep in the order that you spoke. So Murad, uh, one minute closing remarks. Yeah, th thank you, Lee. I, I think that the most imperative issue is the uh, the Cold War um, being instigated under global Britain, um, materialising into a hot war uh, from from sending naval a naval uh, naval cavalcade to uh, the Indo Pacific. That's one thing we must uh, look at. Uh, very uh, carefully and with much concern whilst we've got the government increasing military expenditure and uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, when quite honestly, the, the demands, uh, we've, uh, demands in the economy are, are much greater in the health service and in our environmental concerns if you want to address them in the immediate future. They are by far the better uh, public expenditure areas than um, any increased military expenditure and uh, increasing warheads. And I think this is only the first part of the international, uh, the uh, integrated review. And I think we've got to be very, very careful. Uh, we, we need to respond with uh, other proposals and suggestions and continue doing that. So uh, the, the electorate in future knows quite clearly what they're buying into. The only glimmer of hope I can give you is the one I mentioned earlier. One, uh, one, one party leader dis, uh, did say during the last election that she would press the nuclear button and we soon so, saw her political career dashed in, 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 <laughs> in, 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 in instantaneously. So I, I do think the public are clued up on these things and let's not lose sight of that. Thank you very much, Mark uh, Weisbrot. One minute closing remarks. 
again, you're you need to unmute. Thanks. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I mean, these issues are also urgent. I, I don't want to give any uh, necessary priority to, uh, you know, the ones that I work on, for example, or, uh, I mean, I, I think, though, uh, one thing that I think doesn't get enough attention and is related to all of these issues is uh, really uh, the uh, the conflict between the the rich and poor countries, and the you know the role of the United States and Europe, and I think this is important for a whole number of reasons. Well, I mean, people have already brought up the Cold War. That's just another example, right? So, U.S. wants to dominate China and it can't, uh, and so I mean, U.S. government does, and I think that so that that affects climate and everything else that we want to see. But also with the rest of the world that it doesn't have the independence and power that uh, China has, uh, it, it's a more devastating thing. If, we, if you think about Africa or Latin America or much of Asia still, uh, the, if you don't have, you know, if you don't have self-determination uh, in your economic policies, uh, then you, you don't have democracy really. And um, there's a little bit of that problem in Europe, for example, though some of the countries in the Eurozone found that out, uh, that they didn't have control of their most important macro policies in the Great Recession, and it hurt them a lot, especially Greece, of course, but also Italy and Spain and others. And so uh, I think that this is, this is just a huge problem, and it's one that is going to end. And somebody mentioned that China has played a, a big positive role. And I wanna, I, I, I wanna uh, reinforce that, you know, most of the people that came out of extreme poverty in the world since 1980 were in China and the ones that didn't live there, actually China had a lot to do with that as well through its investment exports. Uh, I mean, uh, buying the exports of, of the rest of the world, especially Africa. Uh, and it was a huge thing I mean, because it became the largest uh, economy in the world. So uh, this is the kind of thing, the kind of progress in the world that people don't pay attention to that is really essential. It's really essential for countries to have the ability to determine their own development policies. And they don't have that right now in, I would say, still most of, of the world. Thank you, Mark. That's that has to change. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. and to Mark Watts, just one minute on any final remarks or thoughts on the battle for climate justice. Can I? Can I just make? No, Mark, I'll come to you in a second. Okay. Sorry, no matter. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, on the on climate justice. First, wealthy nations now need to deliver on the much improved commitments that they've made. That means a decisively green recovery from the COVID pandemic ending all public subsidy for the fossil fuel economy uh, and a decisive investment in uh, new jobs in the new green economy, which is gonna become the decisive. And then secondly, we need vaccine equity uh, alongside the, del the delivery of the promise of the $100 billion plus per year of climate finance from the, the West to the global South. Thank you very much. And Namala, would you like to just say one minute closing remarks? Yes, uh, there, there are slight glimmers of hope because after this pandemic, uh, this apocalyptic uh, scenes in India, even Modi's own party members have suffered a great deal. And there have been a lot of questions and he has had to, he has been forced to declare free vaccines to all. And also he, the BJP has suffered some significant losses in the recent state assembly elections and maybe set to lose a few more, which is, which is going to eat into there. But we in Britain have to support the efforts to, to destabilize the Modi regime. That's the biggest um, you know, support we can give uh, to, the, to the left and to the people of India for in, in support of Indian democracy. And, and also identify the forces who are supporting Modi here and engage with them in a different way and, 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 and be very forthright and open about it, uh, challenging, 
questioning. Uh, and I, I don't see that happening at the moment. So there are few of us who, who are constantly banging on about it. So I will end with the farmer's slogan, save farmers, save democracy in India. Well, that's a powerful way to end the session. So thank you for everyone for participating. And it's clear that we on the left need to be clear that to win a game, as our speaker said, Labour should not only be a clear anti-austerity party, but we need to be a party that's an internationalist party that advocates for peace and not war, takes seriously the international cooperation needed against climate change and the global battle against global inequality, especially at this moment um, for vaccine equity. So I'd like to thank all the speakers again and we'll be moving straight over now to our um, final rally, which has John McDonnell, Laura Pidcock, Richard Bergen and many others. Now, remember, if you can make a donation, the links are in the chat. And please follow our media partner, Labour Outlook, which has got lots of articles by the speakers today. And we'll be covering this event in the next few days. So thank you to all the speakers. And we look forward now to the closing rally.